Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Warren Bolton with Mount Zion Baptist Church, Black River Road in Camden, and it's just another good and blessed day to be alive. We thank God for another opportunity to share his word. And we're just going to jump right in. We're going to be in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the 13th chapter and the 23rd verse. Just one verse, Jeremiah chapter 13, and verse 23. And it reads this way. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to to do evil. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, you are good and great and mighty God, and we thank you for being our God, the God who blesses us. Bless us now, Lord God, with your presence, Lord. Fill me, Father, fresh with your spirit, that I might preach your word with power and demonstration, Lord. And Lord, even though this is preaching time, this is your time with your people. There's someone right now who needs to be healed. Heal their bodies. Someone who needs to be comforted. Comfort them right now in the name of Jesus. Someone, Lord God, who needs provision in their lives, thank you for being their provider, their way maker. Whatever your people stand in need of, Lord God, bless them now, right now, in the name of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God made me this way. God made me this way. Um... Throughout this week, this past week, and through all day yesterday, I've seen posts on Facebook, and I've talked to different people I know, black people, who were telling me that this year it was a struggle for them to get in the spirit of celebrating the 4th of July. And they were struggling to celebrate the birth of America. They were struggling to celebrate America's freedom. They were uh, struggling to celebrate um, the, the Declaration of Independence for America. And they were saying that, Pastor, they said, although the preamble of the Declaration of Independence reads that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they said, but black people weren't treated as equal and even were enslaved as America declared its own freedom. And so they struggled with that on yesterday. And I'll tell you, it shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be so, but in the United States, the color of your skin matters. At times in our history, um, the color of your skin has determined where you live, what water fountain you drink from, what school you attended, what jobs you were able to get, where you sat on a public bus, whether you got to ride to school on a school bus, whether you could vote, and so many aspects of our lives. We've made many strides, uh, strides throughout history and come a long way. Uh, and at least as a matter of law, those limitations no longer exist. Yet, in today's America, skin color still matters. When you talk about poor people in South Carolina, more than likely you're talking about black people. When you're talking about the people in our prisons and in our jails, more than likely you're talking about black men. When you talk about people who are more likely to die at the hands of police, no matter how minor the alleged, the alleged crime is, you're talking about a black man. And with the recent murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis by police, our country has been thrust into the midst of a vigorous discussion over uh, unfair police practices, racial injustice, and related inequities, all driven by racism. And now people are demanding <coughs> that there be a change. Slavery and the maltreatment of black people is America's original sin. 
While we've made progress, it hasn't come easy. There a lot of lives been all, been lost. There's a lot of shedding of blood, a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears have gone into this. A lot of division and strife has gone into this struggle. America was, was, was really led into progress, kicking and screaming. Kicking and screaming out of slavery and, and black codes and Jim Crow and segregation and uh, disenfranchisement, all manner of dis, uh, discrimination. And yet today racism persists. Inequality and inequity persists. Bigotry persists. And it's all based on the pigmentation of one's skin. Excuse me, but God made me this way. God made me uh, uh, black. God made me with melanin in my skin. It was God who created me with a darker hue. And I thank God for making me who I am. I know in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, the Apostle Paul declared, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I didn't make myself. God made me. And there are those people yet today who still decide, though, even though it's God who made us who we are, there are still people who decide that they take it into their own hands and they use your skin color to determine the, your potential um, criminality. If you're a certain skin color, you're more likely to be a criminal. You're more likely to be stopped. You're more likely to be frisked. They decide your work based on your skin color. They decide your character based on your skin color. I shall never forget 1984, the summer of 1984, I, I went to intern at the Charlotte, Charlotte Observer as a reporter. And I was there with about 12 to 15 other young college people. And we had this initial meeting, first time we met anybody in the newspaper. We sat in there with all the editors. And after that meeting, it lasted about 30 minutes. There was this woman who came to me, one of the editors. All the editors were white. And she walked up to me and she said, I already know that you and I aren't going to get along. And I didn't know how she knew that because I had never met her before. That was my first time laying eyes on her. All I knew is I was the only black person in that room. And she came to me and told me, I know that we aren't going to get along. Lord have mercy. I remember also on another occasion back in 1989 and when I was a reporter uh, at the state newspaper and the then sheriff, who now is deceased of Richland County, had made this remark to one of our reporters. And there was a lot of crime and violence going on at Columbia Mall. And our reporter asked him what did he think as sheriff that could be done to address the crime. And he said the way to address the crime was to get all the ends out. Keep all the ends out of the mall. Lord have mercy. And I remember another time back in 2013 when my younger son who was four at the time and my older son who was eight, we were taking my older son to summer camp. We got to summer camp, and we were walking up like everybody else does to, to go and sign in. And the, the woman who was an older white woman who was a counselor was checking everybody in. And as we walked up to them, she said about my son, she said, there, there go the two little criminals. I won't tell y'all what I said to her, but, but we had a discussion, and, and she apologized. But even after dealing with her, I had to talk to my sons. And particularly my four-year-old who kept asking me, because she said it not once, she said twice, there goes the two little criminals. And my younger son kept saying, Daddy, who is she talking about? <laughs> Daddy, who is she talking about? And I had to respond, and I had to address that with the both of them. I had to tell them why this woman well, might have said what she said. And today, they're 11 and 14, my boys are, 
and I still have to have discussions with them every time another black man has been killed by police or every time that, that we have some racial uh, flare-up. But more importantly, what did come out of that positive for me, that when that camp counselor had said, here come the two little criminals, I took it upon myself to begin to tell them who they are. And I had to affirm them, and I began to affirm them daily when we were in the car, whether we were going to camp or when school came in, every morning going to school, we would have a discussion, and I had to let them know that they their identity did not come from man, but their identity comes from God. Their identity isn't driven by the color of their skin, but their identity is driven by who God says they are. And I would start in the morning, I would tell them, I said, you're going to excel and exceed in the classroom. You're going to excel and exceed as a person. You're going to grow up and you're going to excel and exceed in college. You're going to excel and exceed in all you do, all you put your hands on, you're going to have great success. I would tell them this every morning. Then I would tell them, repeat after me. We are the king's kids, member of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. I said, repeat after me, Alexander and Christopher. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed and not cursed. I'm well and not sick. I'm rich and not poor. I'm a success and not a failure. And without fail, we would repeat that day in and day out because I wanted them to know that although as they go through life in their dark skin, they're not what people say they are. They're what God said they are. It's God who made them that way. And in our text in Jeremiah 13 and 23, the Bible asks a probing question about a man whose skin happens to be dark. It asks, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Ethiopians were Cushites, descendants of Cush, the grandson of Noah in Ham's line. And it pleased God uh, to cause him to be born black. There was a time when, when there were some twisted folks who would twist the scripture and say that black skin and slavery were a result of God cursing Ham and his descendants. But the devil is a liar. There was no such curse put on black people. If you're black, it's because God made you black. And the Bible says here that the Ethiopian could not change his skin even if he wanted to. That's because it was God's doing. And it could not be undone. Let me tell you a little more about the Cushites. Cushite is a Hebrew name used to refer to a dark-skinned person. Nubians and Ethiopians, Africans, you know, black folks. Uh, uh, all those were Cushites. They were black people. Africa is the cradle of civilization. It was the center of great mathematicians and, and uh, engineering and architecture and, and medical discoveries. The city of Alexandria was known for its great library and intellectual work. Timbuktu, which was called the Golden City, was known for its great schools. And the Nubians, they lived in the northern uh, Sudan and southern Egypt along the Nile River. And it was believed that they were among the first humans. While it often, has often been presented from a, a white perspective, the fact is that there is a great presence of people of color in the Bible. Nimrod, who was referred to as the first on earth to become a mighty warrior, was a Cushite. Moses married an Ethiopian. Simon of Cyrene was, was the one who carried the cross of Christ, and he was a black man. If you're black, you're black because God created you that way. God made the black man just as he made the white man, just as he made the Hispanic, just as he made the Asian. God created us all equal, and he has no respect of person. He doesn't favor the black man over the white man. He doesn't favor the white man over the black man. He favors those who love him and walk in obedience. He favors those who 
treat others the way that they want to be treated. He favors those who walk in love and not in hate. He favors those who do justly and love mercy and, uh, and walk humbly before their God. He favors those who walk in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. If you want to go over to Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man. And he said, let us make it in our own image and our own likeness. He said, and not only that, he said, let's give them some power. He said, let's give them dominion. Dominion over the earth and over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and everything that creepeth over the earth. But while God gave man dominion over all those things, God did not give man dominion over other men. God uh, made men uh, not to be subservient, but to be his children and to rule on earth even as he rules in heaven. God never declared that one man would dominate another man because of his race. Yet, there were those throughout human history who would enslave others <laughs> as whites enslaved black people in America. But that was not of God. God made his children to be rulers, not to be ruled. He made his children to be governors, not to be governed. He offered salvation, not enslavement. Slavery in America came from the pit of hell. The way black men were treated didn't reflect and does not reflect who black people are. If you're black, God made you that way. You're bold and beautiful. You're powerful and mighty. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. If you're black, African American, whatever you choose to be called, accept the, how God has made you and what he has made you to be. Walk in the power and authority he has given you. There's pride in being black. You're black for a reason. Uh, accept your blackness. God chose your blackness for you. Walk in the blessing of your blackness. Now understand now, I didn't say that uh, you're blessed because you're black. What I'm saying is that you're black because you're blessed. Because God blessed you. Because God shaped you. Because God touched you. You're blessed and you're, you're black because God blessed you. You're not blessed because you're black. You're black because you're blessed. And my white brothers and sisters, if, if you're white, you're, you're, not, you're not blessed because you're white. You're white because you're blessed. I, us, we Americans, we're not blessed because we're Americans. There's no such there's nothing so great about being Amer American without knowing the great and mighty God. We're blessed. We're Americans because we're blessed. I don't care where you're from. If God made you, if you're from Mexico, you're not blessed. Because you're Mexican, you're Mexican because you're blessed by God, shaped by God, created by God, made by God. Whatever God has made you, it's a blessing and not a curse. It's God who made us and not we ourselves. In Jeremiah 1 and 5, God said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. God says, I knew you before. I knew you before you were even born black. I knew you before you were discriminated against. I knew you before slavery. I knew you before the hate. I knew you before the dislike. God says, I knew you. I knew you before. And I still made you black. I made you an overcomer. I made you more than a conqueror. I shaped and formed you from the foundation of the world. I gave you purpose and I have a plan for your life. In Jeremiah 29 11, God said, I know the thoughts that I think of you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has given you hope. I don't care what color you are, you got hope. You got a future. God's taking you somewhere. And make no mistake, beloved. You are as God would have you to be. You as black as he would make you to be. You as beautiful as he would have you to be. Anyone who would condemn you for being what God ordained you to be does not have 
a problem with you. Their problem is with the great and almighty God. If you hate people because of their skin color, you better consider your ways. I don't know how people can call themselves saints of God and walk in bigotry and racism. I don't know how people can call themselves lovers of Christ and be racist. First John 4 and 20 tells us if a man say I love God and hate up his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? If you can't love me in all my blackness, how can you say that you love the Lord? <laughs> now understanding the first half of this verse is one thing. It gives us affirmation for who God has made us to be. And give us an understanding. We can't change it. So we have to walk in who God made us to be. And there's a blessing to walk in of walking in who God made us to be. But the second half of this verse here in uh, Jeremiah 13. See, Jeremiah 13, in this chapter, God is speaking to the nation of Judah through the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is prophesying all kinds of bad things that will happen to Judah because of Judah's evil behavior. And God says in Jeremiah 13, 23, he asked the two questions. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Then secondly, he said, or can the leopard change his spots? Then the second half says, then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. God is saying that a man trapped in evil behavior has as much of a chance to turn his own life around as a black man has of changing his skin color. We need Jesus. Romans 3 and 10 tells us that none is righteous. No, not one. God says this is the state of mankind. This is all of our state, beloved. The blessing is that while we can't change ourselves, God can change us. While we can't help ourselves, God can help us. While we can't save ourselves, God can save us. As we try to change our America and make it a more perfect union, marching is fine. But, but, but we still got to pray. Protesting is fine. But we still got to pray. Voting is fine, but we still got to pray. We got to pray. God says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. We need racial healing. We need economic healing. We need all sorts of spiritual healing. We need healing. And I'm going to tell you, those Christians, we, we as Christians going out, talk about, well, who are the Christians for Trump? Who are the Christians for Biden? Who are the Christians for the Republicans? Who are the Christians for Democrats? Let me tell you something. You better be a Christian looking at being on the side of right rather than being on the side of wrong. There are Christians running out there trying to be on the right side of history when you better get on the right side of eternity because God is going to come and he's going to decide it all. He's a God of justice. You're going to sit up there and be political if you want to. I, Lord, let me be spiritual. Let me walk in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Let me do what that's good and acceptable in God's sight. I, I want to do what's right or what's wrong, not what's democratic or what's Republican. I, I, that's what I'm going to choose because James 4, 17 tells us to him who know to do good mm -hmm. and do it and not to him, it is sin. You better choose what's right. You better walk with the Lord because God is going to be the one who's ultimately going to judge. God is an awesome and mighty God. It's God who's made us and not we ourselves. We don't have a right to, to die on one another based on what we look like, based on how he shaped and formed us. God did it. If you got a problem with this, 
Take it up with the Lord. Take it up with the Lord. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Father, you're an awesome God. You're a mighty and magnificent God. Thank you for being the God of justice. Thank you for being the one who shaped and formed all of us, Lord God. Thank you for not being a, a respectable person, Lord. Thank you, Father, just treat me as your son. Father, the one out there who may be unsaved, now I pray for that person that they might be saved. There might be one, Lord God, who heard him this morning. Pray that you strengthen and comfort them, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, beloved.